Everyone, welcome back. Welcome to the, the, the final session in Sustainable Earth uh, 2021. Uh, so hopefully you've had a fantastic time so far. Um, just a few things from housekeeping. We remember that we've got the hashtag Earth Forum 2021. Also remember that we've also got the discussion boards that are very live, relate to a whole bunch of topics and you can carry on the conversations. Um, but in terms of kicking us off into our final galloping uh, session, we have one of the founders of the sustainability movement. We've got John Elkington, a global authority on corporate responsibility and sustainable capitalism. John is the person who coined the, the, the term triple bottom line to describe that, the importance of organizations evaluating their environmental, social and economic performance and the author of the book, The Green Swans. And it's an absolute pleasure to, to invite John. He's, he's, um, he's the chief pollinator, I love that phrase, at, at uh, Volans. And John, please take it away. Ian, thanks very much indeed. And I wish I was with you all uh, in person. Hopefully that time will come relatively quickly. So Alistair, hopefully you can see the PowerPoint now. Let me assume that you, in that case, can. Uh, no, I'm afraid there's a, an issue with that. Would you mind sharing your screen again, please? Yes, OK. That was, that was our screen. Screen. It was going technically no, well. I'm, 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 I'm going through the process again, hopefully. Uh, it's all sent to confuse us all. Um, this is cl clever. A little sort of uh, message comes up right in front of the um, button that's meant to share a screen. But let me just try that again. OK, so I've got press shared screen, and it's now up again. Can you see that? It's not come yet. But... Well, I can share mine on your behalf. So please just let me know when you want me to move forward. Move forward sorry. OK, um, that's uh, strange. OK, let, so can we start with the first one, which is the um, Sustainable Earth one? OK, so that, that hopefully that's right. Good. OK, um, delighted to do this, uh, despite sort of tech uh, glitches, no doubt, all at my end. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, business, and I'm going to talk about the race to net zero, such as it is. I think uh, some people are involved in the race, many are not. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to talk about green swans, uh, and I'll explain in just a moment what those are. Could I have the next slide, please? So I've, I've spent a lot of my time over the last 40 years working in companies, very often at board level or C-suite level, and, and uh, this is the sort of uh, input that these sort of companies increasingly have been experiencing. They don't always know what to do with it. They don't always pay it very much attention. But uh, the sense is growing that something is uh, deeply awry uh, with uh, the world. Next click, please. Um, this was in the New York Times um, just a few days back. And um, I, I do quite a lot of work in Brazil. And, and it's very striking that despite President Bolsonaro and his inability to get his brain around uh, anything complex like COVID-19 or, or climate change or whatever. Um, the, the evidence is piling up, not only in the deaths around COVID-19, but also the incredible drought that has hit uh, the country. Uh, and it does seem as though uh, the destruction of Amazonia is now starting to have real consequences. Next click, please. So many years ago, in fact, in 1991, so that's um, uh, this is almost a, a, an anniversary of that, uh, I got Ingram Pinn, the uh, Financial Times cartoonist still, uh, to draw me this diagram, just showing the nature of the agenda, the change agenda for uh, business. So it's a boardroom table uh, with many of the uh, conventional roles and responsibilities sketched out, but with a fish uh, representing the natural world a woman uh, representing the dispossessed, the social uh, and human rights agenda, and, and then also a robot. And at that time, uh, so this is uh, 30 years ago, um, 
the idea of the robot was simply about long time. So his shoulder flash or her shoulder flash is 3001. But now increasingly, uh, we're seeing uh, the robot being slightly reinterpreted. So for example, uh, people are starting to think about these problems that we're facing now, climate emergency, biodiversity emergency, all of this stuff uh, are so complex that they're possibly even beyond the human brain. So we need expert systems, we need big data, we need robots uh, and artificial intelligence to help us um, uh, deal with all of that. So next click, please. And uh, just within recent days, uh, recent, certainly recent weeks, uh, we've had evidence, I mean, shown here from Bloomberg, but it was all over the business uh, media, that um, three companies had got into considerable difficulties, Chevron, uh, around being instructed by shareholders to cover scope three, i.e. oil in use uh, issues. We had ExxonMobil having, to their absolute horror, uh, three independent uh, directors appointed to their board. I mean, that's a first. Um, and then Shell being instru instructed by a court in Holland to uh, achieve 45% reductions in their greenhouse emissions by 2030, which is very much higher than Shell was imagining uh, they would be uh, asked to do. So this was seen to be a considerable shock for big oil. And what's a shock for big oil is in the end gonna be a shock for all of us. Next one, please. So just a quick um, uh, introduction of, of, of where I'm coming from, so you can pick the right sort of discount factors. So next one, please. Um, I'm a baby boomer, so I'm, I was 72 earlier this uh, week. I founded four social businesses since 1978. They all still exist. I've been on uh, around 80 boards and advisory boards, uh, most of those in business, but quite a few in social enterprise and NGOs and so on and I've done uh, 20 books to date. So if we could have the next two clicks, uh, so that would be great. So the first one is uh, the latest book, Green Swans, Ian kindly mentioned it. The subtitle is The Coming Boom in Regenerative Capitalism, which some people you know, think is uh, outlandish and delusional. I don't, uh, and I'll come on to why I believe it to be uh, the future in just a moment. But when we talk about net zero, and it's in the title of the piece, uh, one of the projects that we're doing at the moment is working with uh, the UK banking sector, with the House of Commons, um, on net zero, and, and, and how business and government can increasingly work more effectively together on all of that. So next one, please. So I, I, I said that some people might think that coming boom in regenerative uh, capitalism strapline was delusional, but in September of last year, so several months after the book came out, I'm not claiming agency, Doug McMillan shown here, who is the CEO of Walmart, the world's largest retailer, uh, announced a commitment uh, to embrace regeneration. He said that uh, Walmart would become a regenerative company. Now that is, way beyond current understandings and definitions of sustainability. Um, the question, do we trust him? Do we uh, have confidence that he'll deliver? Well, at least there's a public uh, commitment. And next slide, or oh, next click, please. And one of the reasons I have a, a bit more confidence than I might otherwise is that uh, Doug McMillan was helped to produce um, that commitment and that speech by Paul Hawkins. Some of you will know, oh, and many of you will know Paul Hawken and, and his extraordinary career. Um, but his most recent book, which will come out in uh, September in the United States, North America, and October in uh, Europe and the Commonwealth uh, markets, is called Regeneration. Uh, and Paul helped Doug do that speech, uh, believes that Walmart will deliver. And one of the things that we've been seeing is uh, companies, major companies in the supply chain of Walmart, for example, Unilever, uh, Nestle, scrambling around to say, what, what, what must we now be doing? What can we put forward to demonstrate uh, commitment and action? Next one, please. So um, I think we're at a, a momentous moment in all of this, and the net zero uh, agenda is one part of a much bigger seismic shift uh, in capitalism. Uh, next, please. And I talked about the um, that, that sort of cartoon. Uh, it was a year before I started to talk about the triple bottom line, which I then 
properly introduced in 1994. Um, to many people's surprise, um, in 2018, I did the first ever, I was told by Harvard Business Review, uh, product recall on a management concept. So I did a product recall on the triple bottom line, not because it's a bad idea, uh, I, I'm likely to say that, but because I felt it was being misinterpreted. And one of the forms of misinterpretation was that people were saying, you know, as long as we meet two of the, um, the, the uh, dimensions of value creation or destruction, that's, that's fine. And the third one can go hang. So we're making a profit economic box ticked. Uh, we're uh, employing people and we're providing um, products that people need. That's the social box tick. It's a shame about the environment. And I saw that too often to be particularly uh, comfortable. So uh, the product recall uh, was launched. Uh, those of you who've worked in business or with business know that a product recall is not an absolute end to a product. It's just saying there's something wrong with this or it's something that's not working. Let's pull it back as car manufacturers often do, and then put it back into the uh, market. Next one, please. And it was it, odd, because within um, uh, about a year of that um, article coming out, and again, I'm not claiming agency, I just seem to have this ability to pick up things that are uh, looming or impending. This was, as many of you will remember, the front cover of the Financial Times. It was a wraparound cover, the first ever that I think they'd done like that. And basically, the um, the message was capitalism is in a fix and we need to fix it. Next click, please. And one of the um, messages that was sort of at least implicit and is becoming increasingly explicit is that the time of Milton Friedman, uh, which at the time had been running for about 50 years, uh, his notion that the only bit, the real uh, purpose of business is to make a profit as long as it meets the rules of the game. I think we're coming out of that era and coming out of it very rapidly. Next one, please. And uh, yesterday we had a, um, uh, well, in fact, no, it was on the 23rd of this uh, week. We had um, the second of our Tomorrow's Capitalism forums. Uh, this one virtual, the, the, the one in um, 2020 was um, face to face. It was just very interesting. The focus was on uh, finance, uh, money markets, investment, and so on. And it was really interesting to see the way in which the climate emergency uh, and behind it, the biodiversity emergency, are now central uh, to uh, at least the thinking of, of, of business leaders in different parts of the world. Um, the question is, how much are they going to be expected to do uh, to achieve solutions and who's going to pay and those sorts of questions. So the agenda has come on. Uh, quite powerfully. So next one, please. So um, I, I mentioned this is a sort of a seismic shift moment in all of this. Uh, we, we, for about two years now, we've talked about the 2020s as the exponential decade. Next, please. I'll explain why in just a moment. Um, many of you will know of the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Um, you'll probably be able to recite all 17 of them, which I can't do, uh, introduced in 2015. Mm -hmm. But we've worked with many companies as they've they've sort of tried to get their brains around the goals, and and, and you know many of them have signed up now. Uh, but what they often tend to do is to say, "What are we already doing, and how does that map onto the seventeen goals?" Oh, good, we've got about five or six. Uh, we're, we're we're in the clear. That is not the way I see uh, the sustainable development goals. I actually think they're an exponential change agenda. And if you just look at the first two goals, no poverty by 2030 and zero hunger by 2030. Even if you push those deadlines and dates out to the 2050s, that would still be an exponential uh, change agenda. But we're talking about 2030 or at least the 2030s. So next, please. And I think many business people have really struggled to get their brains around uh, all of that. So we started to talk about swans. I mean, it started off with uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, shown here. Many of you will have read his book, The Black Swan, or you'll have read at least reviews of it. His notion of the black swan was these were events that come out of the blue, take us completely by surprise, have an off the scale uh, impact. Uh, and then afterwards, we don't always properly understand what's just happened to us. So we sort of set ourselves up for um, uh, a, a, a return match. So next click, please. 
And in a way, COVID-19 has been an example of that sort of phenomenon. Although Taleb has been asked, as many of you will have seen a number of times, is COVID-19 a black swan? And his answer is no, because we did see it coming. We had government units, we had reports and so on saying, it's not just a pandemic risk, it's a coronavirus pandemic risk. And this is where it's going to hit. Most of those reports, most of those units were either disbanded or, or ignored. So not uh, a black swan, perhaps a gray swan or something like that. Next click, please. So some of you will have seen uh, either this diagram, which comes from Silicon Valley and Singularity University, or diagrams very much like it. Next click, if you would. Um, exponential trajectories are pretty peculiar, and the human brain is very poorly configured to uh, cope uh, with them. Um, and uh, next one, please. And one of the examples of that, I think even scientists struggle uh, with the sort of the, the climate emergency and the extraordinary excursion from the mean, the extraordinary shift in the carbon content of our uh, atmosphere uh, shown in this uh, NASA diagram. Uh, next click, please. So one of the things that we've been doing is, is, is trying to find out who's actually out there already uh, working on projects at the scale that would address this. And on the right, you have Azam Alwash, who's the guy who's reclaiming the Iraqi marshes. Well, he's not doing it on, on his own, but he's doing it with uh, government actors and foundations and so on. And I think that is the sort of scale of uh, nature-based solutions that we will now increasingly need. On, on, on the left, you have Ivan Shuna, who is very unusual, very early pioneer in terms of the business leader world, in terms of about talking about climate, about sustainability, and particularly about uh, regeneration. So next slide. And this is a complex diagram, and I'm only going to skim across it. And if we could have the next click at the same time, it just uh, put that human brain back into the picture. Uh, I highly recommend the work of Rethink X. They're based both in the UK and in Silicon Valley. And they've done a series of studies on the future of, for example, transp transportation of ability uh, of the cattle ranching and dairying industry, particularly in the United States, uh, with that one of energy and now increasingly with the financial uh, markets. And the basic theme throughout those is the same, that the, the exponential dynamics that play through in um, our economies and through markets tend to take everyone by surprise as they really start to shift, because you have a series of virtuous cycles that aid the new solution. It might be, uh, for example, electric vehicles, and a series of um, uh, vicious cycles that sort of create the sort of death spiral uh, for uh, some of the incumbent and problematic industries. And that's what I think we're beginning to see signaled, uh, not only by Chevron and ExxonMobil and Shell, but also by the International Energy Agency, which has gone very public saying, we've got to stop investing in fossil fuels now. So this is something that is becoming part of the, uh, the, the sort of the paradigm in a way. The paradigm is actually shifting and it's shifting quite rapidly. So next one, please. So I'm just gonna talk very briefly towards a conclusion about green swans uh, themselves. So next one, please. Uh, and I think the picture that we're looking out on is one in which quite a number of the industries that we've grown up with that have been very powerful uh, through our lives, and uh, clearly I've been uh, around for a lot longer than many people uh, in this conference, but we're going to see mighty industries crumbling and disappearing very rapidly. Next one, please. And this is a World Resources Institute in a set of indicators and, and uh, of what sort of level of change we're gonna need to see in different markets with different technologies. I won't go through them all. I mean, this is to achieve the 1.5 uh, climate target, but uh, increasingly that looks extremely unlikely, almost regardless of what uh, happens at COP26 uh, later this year. But these sorts, the scale of these sorts of transitions and transformations uh, should give any incumbent industry pause. Next one, please. And if you could have the next one up as well at the same time. So um, when we look at green swans, and one of the areas that we look at is not just technology and business models, but policy frameworks. Um, and both in the European Union and in the United States, you now have 
uh, effectively green deals, uh, the, 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 the labeling uh, varies. But what we're seeing is governments, and, and it looks as though the Biden-Harris administration has got um, early uh, support for their infrastructure uh, programs. Um, we're talking about trillions. I mean, 1.82 trillion euros in the case of the European Union, uh, a number of trillion dollars in the case of the United States. Now, can we spend that money efficiently and effectively? Uh, can it be done without monumental fraud? Uh, there are so many other factors at work here, but uh, I think these uh, policy measures are a signal of where things are increasingly going. Next one, please. And, and many of you will have seen these sorts of diagrams. I mean, it's extraordinary. Just in the last couple of days, we've had the announcement that uh, renewable energy, solar, wind, battery, technology and systems are now cheaper than installed fossil fuel plants, including nat natural gas. I mean, this is a major shock uh, for uh, countries, not just industries that rely on fossil fuels. So one of the projects we're doing, for example, at the moment is with the United Arab Emirates. And you know, it's an oil-based uh, economy. And uh, incre I'm trying to invest in renewables and hydrogen and things like that. But the scale of what's coming at us uh, is only just beginning to sink home with governments, uh, with heads of industry, with CEOs and investors uh, in particular. Next one, please. And one of the things that we're uh, getting a lot of uh, pleasure out of, and I think sort of is feeding our optimism, is working with younger people. Uh, in this particular case, with a Madrid-based uh, infrastructure and renewable energy company called Acciona. So they, they operate uh, globally. Uh, they're just spinning out their renewable energy uh, um, business and it'll become the business pure, biggest pure um, renewable energy uh, provider in the world. But they asked us last year to work with um, uh, 27 of their uh, fast track uh, leaders from different parts of the world, younger than the average, you might say kindly, um, and we started off basically being asked, develop us a five-year plan, uh, build it around sustainable development, and then give it to us. By the end of the process, it was a 10-year strategy for the and roadmap for the entire company, and it was built around not just sustainable development, but about around regeneration. And I think the difference between those two concepts is quite significant. Uh, next one, please. Now, this is towards the, the, the last slide. Uh, and this is a Three Horizons map, which uh, is based on the work of people like Bill Sharp. Um, and what we're talking about here, uh, and we've been using with universities and business schools quite a lot, is a model that suggests we've all grown up in a world where we thought we knew what was going on. And a lot of that goes back to 19, 1944 and Bretton Woods. We've grown up with the UN uh, system and all the rest of it. And certain views of economics, uh, that world is starting to come apart. And history suggests that when those systems come apart, it's again an accelerative curve. So I think if we're lucky, we'll be through this in about 12 to 15 years. I think it's likely to take uh, longer. The political consequences are immense. Um, so the question here is, you know, business, uh, can it step up? Why does it need to step up, step up to the net zero challenge? It's This is something for us all. It's not just business, it's, it, 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 it's governments and regulatory institutions, it's accounting bodies, it's a, you know, the discipline of economics. And behind that science too, science is critically necessary uh, to ensure that we do the right thing when we do act. In the middle, you have the resilience uh, wave. And we increasingly hear people switching from talking about responsible and how responsible they are uh, to Oh my God, you know, our economies, our societies, our communities, the natural environment, they're all wobbling. We've got a resilience crisis. And the only way that I know to address uh, resilience is to invest in the health uh, of the systems that you depend on. And that's about regeneration. So I think that's where we're headed. Uh, next one, which I think hopefully will be the final one. Yes, just an example of the sort of uh, um, innovation that we love to see. So electric vehicles uh, will be all around us uh, very uh, shortly, no question about that. But Thomas Heath Heatherwick, who is one of my favorite uh, designers, has come up with a <clears throat> concept electric vehicle here. Yeah, it's called the Aero. Uh, and it, what, what's remarkable about it is it isn't simply electric and therefore clean at the point of um, 
uh, use, it's also going to clean up uh, urban air. It's almost like a catalytic converter on uh, wheels. And that's the sort of mindset, that's the sort of approach that not just the energy industry, but anyone making things, uh, producing raw materials or whatever, is going to have to get their brain around. And if they don't, to put it bluntly, they will be out of business in a remarkably short period of time. So, um, Ian, if I could hand back to you at that point. And Alistair, thanks very much for uh, handling the slides. Thank you, and, so, and sorry, John, for that uh, little brilliant start. Um, a couple of quick questions then, um, yeah. which will probably be obviously complex and long. And um, one from uh, Giles, is regenerative capitalism still predicated on a growth model? Uh, it, it's a brilliant question, and you will expect me to say either yes, in which case I'll get thumped, or no, in which case I'll get ignored by business. Let me say, I think we've got to um, run down very actively certain industries that have very big footprints and are, are problematic but we've at the same time got to grow parts of the economy uh, that are much more uh, potentially at least uh, sustainable so it's a mixed story uh, uh, we've got to go into a very rapid period of degrowth and balance that with new forms of growth very happy to talk about that uh, offline off, off camera my email is john at volans.com Fantastic. And the other one, I love this from Oliver Baines. He just says, China question <laughs> mark. I've, I've, I've worked quite a lot in China over the years. And, and um, I, I'm very impressed by the pace at which they are developing their solar, wind and, and, and battery and, and electric vehicle uh, industries. But there's something in me which just doesn't believe that that form of um, governance and that form of economic system uh, can continue without a major war. So uh, you know, I, I, that's getting us into difficult territory. But I, I actually think when I talk about that 12 to 15 year U bend, where an old order comes apart and a new one uh, crashes through, um, becomes reality, I think China will be in there. And I think China will be immensely important. But I have a, a growing sense that it won't be as immensely important as it's currently uh, assuming. And a last word maybe for Chris Hines, or ex uh, suffers against sewage in, in Eden Project. So he says, on a percentage basis, how confident are you of us getting through this in the required changes in time to avoid runaway climate change? So he wants a percentage for me. Maybe that's a business. Thing. I, I, I love Chris. I love surfers against sewage. I think it's a brilliant story. Um, I, I think human beings can. Uh, um, step up and, and, and make extraordinary things happen. And I think Chris, Chris is a beautiful, wonderful example of that. But, you know, what, what's, it's taken us decades to even begin to sort out the UK uh, sewerage system. So uh, how confident I, am I? I think parts of the world will do this. Parts of the world will not. Uh, it will cause immense tensions. I think, just a final point, I think younger people are going to have um, challenges and opportunities here off the scale greater than anything that my generation had to uh, wrestle with. But I don't think it's a single generation that's going to have to carry the can here. I think this is a pan-generational project. We've all got to work together. And the older generations that have uh, you know, the bulk of the wealth, the bulk of the, bulk, bulk of the connections, uh, the influence and so on, cannot simply take their hands off the wheel and say, now it's over to Greta and uh, her ilk. We're, we're all in it together. And we should look around for some of the brilliant success stories like Surface Against Sewage to get a sense of how we best do this. Well, he's got a sub question, which I'll allow you the last thing is, is what's the single thing everyone can and should do? I think one of the critical things is just get, a, get your brain around the science of this so that you understand why this is necessary. Because when inevitably the industries that are going to be hit by this push back, We've got to have not just a, um, what we think, what we like, but we've got to have a business case to why this is the future. So understand the science. And, and, and that's even more important where people are choosing to uh, take uh, science as sort of an optional thing. You either believe in it or you don't. Uh, sci we either get the science right here, and that's why I think, uh, Ian, your work is so fundamental, uh, or we're not going to make this work at all, uh, which is a negative <laughs> uh, point to end on, but I, but I believe it. No, it's, well, it's been hugely positive ac across the, the last few minutes. And I, and it's nice because we have a, 
you know, there's been quite a lot of, I wouldn't say negativity, but despondency a little bit. It, you know, and so it's really nice to hear of a, uh, you know, of an aspirational and inspirational way forward. So John, thank you very, very much. I'm going to close thank it there. You move across the next session. There's a discussion board if people want to move across and click on that within the agenda. Um, but thank you, John, and thank you everyone for joining us.